Hello, I'm Lisette Sutherland, and I am the big cheese at Collaboration Superpowers, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising Podcast. Hello, welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Cleff, and I am delighted to be joined today with Lisette Sutherland. Hi, Andy. Thank you for having me on the show. I wanted to share with our listeners just the backstory about how you and I first met. I think it was years ago, and I'm afraid to count how many. I had been working 100% co-located. I had just changed jobs. I came across some of Jorgen's work, joined the Happy Melly team, and my first team was hybrid. It was half co-located, half all over the world, and I felt so lost. And I reached out on the Happy Melly Slack channel. I forget which room it was in, but it was, I, I feel so out of my comfort zone. I'm dealing with these remote teams. I don't know what to do. Who can help me? And Jorgen just did this little cryptic. Uh, I think Lizette might be able to help you. Is that how it started? That's how it started. Oh, that's exciting. Thanks, Jurgen. And I looked you up because I didn't know anybody in Happy Melly. And I, and I look up, huh, Lizette Sutherland. Yeah, it looks like she might be able to help me. And you came through with, with so many ideas and tools. And you were so generous. And it was wonderful. And that was uh, oh. the beginning oh. of our friendship. Indeed. And then we worked together even, right? We worked together for a year. Uh, Happy Melly. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful how these remote connections. And the interesting thing is we have never met in person. That's true. That so is we have true. a completely virtual relationship. So I've run you up once again for your help and wisdom. Last year, we did a fun series of podcasts, the 12 Days of Agile riffing off the 12 days of Christmas. There was one particular show with our my board members, Jay, Chris. They were discussing the sixth agile principle. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information is uh, through face-to-face -face conversation. And we were talking about how in this world, distributed teams are more the norm. And someone, one of our listeners or somebody on our coalition site said, I'm sorry, there is no replacement for face-to-face. -face. The minute you go distributed, you begin to suffer. So we began to chat and ponder who could help us unpack that myth that teams can't possibly be excellent if they're remote. And I thought, I think I know somebody who has a regular, <laughs> a regular podcast, Collaboration Superpowers, somebody who does workshops the Work Together Anywhere workshop, and somebody who's just released a new book. So here you are again, coming to my rescue, Lisette. I hope. I hope so. I hope I have some good tips. I think I do. I definitely have some good tips. I just wrote 370 pages, so I think I should have something uh, that would be helpful for your listeners. Yeah. What's the title of your new book? The title is Work Together Anywhere. And then the subtitle, A Handbook on How to Work Remotely Successfully for Individuals, Teams, and Managers. So I want to note that it's not called Work From Anywhere. Like it's not about how to work on a beach or, uh, you know, how to go to Bali and, or go skiing and work also. It's really about how can teams work together anywhere from wherever they are. Love it. So one of the questions that comes up for me is, what do we mean by a distributed team? What, what's your definition of remote? I keep it super simple. I keep it, if you're not in the same room together, you're remote. So, you know, if you can't just lean over and say, hey, Bob, how's that marketing report? Then, then you're remote to some degree or another. And of course, there's different degrees of remote and different types of remote teams. But I like to just, I just keep it simple that way. Not in the same room. So my design team, which is on a different floor in a different building, and your definition is remote. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you tease it apart by distance? Is it important if they're one floor up or five 
time zones or is it the same beast? The more the distance increases, the more difficult it gets, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, if you have a team working in Vietnam and one in San Francisco, uh, you're going to have more issues than if you have a team working on one floor uh, versus another floor. Uh, there's no question there. Time zones and, you know, culture and all kinds of things get in the way. So, yes, uh, yes, there are differences. And yes, it gets harder the further apart that you are. Not impossible, though, just harder. But it, but it's another element to think about. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The other piece that I want to pack up, un- unpack about the, the sixth Agile principle is what we mean by face-to-face conversation. So 2001, face-to-face was quite literal. We did not have the same connectivity tools, the same bandwidth that we have today. What do you mean by face-to-face? Is, is video face-to-face equivalent to in the same room? I call it e-face to e-face. It's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely as face-to-face, I would say, but it's e-face to e-face. And all, nothing compares with being in the same room. Like if you're hanging out together, I'll, to give you an example, the Happy Melly team who has been working together for years now had never met before until two weeks ago. And we all met in Lisbon. We shared an Airbnb together and a big group of us went out one night and we went out on the town and we hit up a bunch of bars and we ended up, you know, drinking gin and tonics in the streets of Lisbon and dancing and having a great time. And that you'll never recreate that virtually. It's just until we get, until virtual reality becomes really, really good. But until that time, you're just not going to have it. So it's not the same. It's different. And I think that's the most important part. People say, oh, it's better or it's worse. And I'm like, no, 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 it's different. It's a different kind of working. It's a, it's a different way of interacting, but it doesn't mean that it's worse necessarily. Just different. Just different. And it's a, yeah, you just have to learn, you know, everything is weird until you get used to it. So you know, Skype was kind of weird in the beginning until everybody got used to it. And then, uh, you know, the, the our phones, you know, I remember talking to my boyfriends in high school with a phone that connected to the wall, you know, with a cord that connected to the wall and, you know, think how far we've come. So it's only weird until you get used to it. Right. Dial a phone or <laughs> my kids are, are amazed that I had any social life in high school. They, they're, how did you coordinate? I, <laughs> Wait a minute, you had one phone in the house, only one phone, and only if somebody was home, did somebody answer it? I mean, how did did you get together for a party? Uh, What if you change plans, right? There's this note, oh. I have to say, I don't even know how I got, I don't even know how I got around without Google Maps. Like I have no idea, I'm a terrible navigator and I have no idea how I did it until 2000, until I got my iPhone. (laughs) Right, and, and I wonder if a part of our map brain that wiring is gonna is gonna devolve away that we won't need it anymore. So, so you've written this. You've done a lot of research. You've talked to a lot of people. Let's share both the benefits and the hazards, or or the the gotchas. So, starting with benefits, what are you seeing emerged? as uh, some of the, the positive benefits, the stories you're hearing about uh, remote teams or distributed teams? Well, it's funny because a lot of managers are afraid of allowing people to work remote because they think they're going to just travel to exotic places and become digital nomads and they'll never see them again. They'll get pictures from beaches and mountains everywhere. And that is you, that is totally not the case, at least what I found from my research. There's a small percentage of people that want to do that, but most people just want a little flexibility in their schedule. They want some freedom. They want to avoid the commute or train for a triathlon or uh, you know, stay, walk their daughter to school. I heard that a new, you know, numerous times. People just wanted to spend more time with their kids and family. So I've, the benefits largely are all around freedom and the various kinds of freedom that people have. So, yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's about it. Just flexibility and freedom. One of the things I hear from my team when they choose to work from home, and we don't do it a lot, is they say, man, I was so productive today. Right. And, And there's this constant also managerial concern. Well, if you're home, you're going to be doing the laundry, walking the dog, um, fixing this, blah, 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 blah. Yet, Anecdotally, what I'm hearing is, no, I'm productive. I don't get interrupted by people dropping by my workspace. I don't get interrupted by loud conversations. Uh, I'm wondering if other people have said, 
not only flexibility and freedom, but I'm actually more productive when I'm remote. Oh, yeah. Tons, tons. The interruptions at the office are enormous. And also, they're, they're not controllable. They're not in your control. I mean, some people just stop by, there's a birthday party, and there's cake in the conference room, or you just stopped for a cup of coffee, or you needed to go get a cup of coffee and ran into so-and-so, and 30 minutes later, you're back at your desk wondering what you were working on to begin with. I mean, the, you know, it's a definitely for focus, people want to be able to work in a place where they're most productive. I'm trying to stay away from saying from home because for some people, home is not the most productive place, but they want to work from yeah wherever they're most productive, co-working space, coffee shop, library, home, whatever it is. Yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes you need to hear the typing of other people around you, even if you're not talking. Oh, yeah. In fact, I virtually co-work with a woman for with a couple of people in California, and we have the video off and the sound on so that we can just hear each other type and we just hear that there's stuff happening. And that simulates what it's like to kind of sit in a cubicle next to somebody. You know, you can, you just, you just feel that people are there and every once in a while I'll say, Hey, Gretchen, can you help me with this blog post? I'm really struggling with this paragraph. And, you know, and she'll say, yeah, give me one second. I'll be right there. Yeah. So that's, that's possible. That's a little more graceful than what I experienced some days. Somebody's walked up and said, Hey, Andy, I slacked you. You didn't answer. So I emailed you and you didn't answer. So here I am. You got five seconds. Uh you're like, <laughs> <laughs> See, that's when it helps to be. A, that's when it hopes to be in your own environment where people can't get to you. In the press, you hear competing stories. You hear Best Buy, Yahoo, IBM, who tried and then stopped remote options. You hear about companies like Gap that experienced uh, that added remote options. What are you, What are you hearing? Which way is the teeter totter teetering? Well, it's a. Uh, it's going to de- so it depends on the company and that's the biggest thing and when i when i listened back to the episode that you guys did um on your there was like the sixth day of christmas yeah um it was really all about uh what works for your team what is the best thing for your team right now i think that remote options are only going to get more and more popular. I mean, the technology is making it so easy. There's no reason not to do it. So the remote options are just going to get more and more popular. And companies would be wise because employees want freedom and flexibility. So companies would be wise to offer that to them. And managers are afraid that people aren't working, but people value that freedom and flexibility. They know they can't slack off. They know they have to get the job done. So most of the time, people work way too hard rather than not, you know, not hard enough. Very, it's, it's very rare that I meet slackers. I mean, as of course, the people that I interview, I'm, I'm self-selecting for a highly, you know, productive remote team, of course, but it's really rare that people are like, yeah, I'd really like to have some shenanigans going on in the background and nobody noticing that that just doesn't happen. Right. And I can't remember what the question was now. Me neither. <laughs> we could rewind the tape and listen okay. to it. But we could move <laughs> okay. on. I went off on a tangent, I think. So... <sighs> With, so you mentioned the technology that just gets better every day in the bandwidth. I'm, I'm wondering aloud, is there any work, let's, let's pick the industry of um, creative knowledge work, is there anything that absolutely requires co-location today besides wandering around Lisbon drinking gin and tonics? I'm thinking pairing, mobbing, brainstorming. Are there digital equivalents for all of that? Oh, there's for sure digital equivalents to all of that. It's just a matter of how people use it and are, are people interested. With a remote team, everybody has to be engaged. So if you've got a couple of people who are totally not participating, they're not uh, coming to the meetings, they're not using the tools, uh, then you're going to have to have a problem. Everybody has to be sort of proactively engaged to make it work. And I again, I again uh, forgot the origin question. I, th- I think I need to start notes. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It's just, I'm all nervous. <laughs> just keep going lean. You talked about management. And so I, I, I want to tease apart getting started. So if either it's an employee, an individual contributor that wants to, wants more flexibility and needs to convince the boss, or management that wants to build a remote team to attract and retain better talent, how did we get started? Oh, man. Well, the first thing I would do is assess what your communication tools look like. And what I mean by that is 
Um, on a remote team, you want to make communicating with each other as easy as possible. And I always use the Star Trek analogy, which I know not everybody is a Star Trek fan like I am. But you want to have one of those communicators that they have on their chest where they just like click and they say, okay, Riker to Picard, and then Picard answers right away. Like you want to make communicating that easy where you just push a button and you're talking to somebody. So I would say from a manager's perspective, that's the first place that I would invest time. So making sure everybody has a decent set of headsets and making sure people have a quiet place to do video conferencing, making sure there's a webcam attached to the to the laptop somehow. Most of them come installed, but I've seen a lot of old equipment in my workshop, so I still mention it. Yeah, and just making sure that the team has the tools needed in order to communicate well. A lot of companies, especially the bigger companies, they're all using Skype for business or Link or one of these systems, and they're and they're just terrible, if I may say so myself. I mean, they're just terrible. They're hard to use. They don't work so well. The communication's not great. Maybe for internal use, if everybody's in the office, it works fine, but externally there's problems. So if you're running into those kind of things, I think the manager needs to remove those impediments somehow, like fight the IT department, do whatever you need to do to get decent software and equipment in place. Because the harder it is for people to talk to each other, the less that they're going to do it. So my first step as a manager would be that. My second step would be to create a team agreement together and actually agree on the etiquettes that we're going to use in the office and then the team, the tools that we're actually going to use. Awesome. I want to dive into that more in a little bit. You talked about IT and equipment as an impediment. I, I think as you get up in enterprise scale, you get objections around security. And, and that's right. why there's the tools that are so old and archaic. I don't know if they're more secure. They've just been approved. What are other concerns? Uh, time zones. We talked a little bit about trust and maybe team agreements tie into both of those things. How do, how do you manage across time zones? Time zones is tough. So if you're really far apart, I mean, there's nothing you can physically do to squeeze the world together. So it's going to be tough. But there are some ways to organize better around it. Uh, when I interviewed Johanna Rothman, she mentioned that teams should start to, I mean, if you're going to do follow the sun, then do follow the sun and really organize your team in the follow the sun pattern. But also consider organizing teams from north to south so that you still have great distances between you, but uh, you're in the same time zone. Um, so those are other ways of organizing it. Other things are share the pain. Don't always have one team be uh, waking up early or staying up late. You know, share the pain of the time zones and use your overlap time as much as possible, of course. The other tips are, you know, turn the, do video recordings for each other. So if, if it's really a far, if it's really far away and you're, you're having a team meeting, record the meeting and send it to the person who can't make it. Or instead of typing out an email, send a video message. Um, anything that gets your face, sort of your facial expressions, your face and, and your meaning across to other people. Because we communicate a lot in just the written form. And I think it's a little bit dangerous. I think so much is lost in just communicating through written words. I, there's, I'm sure there's studies out there. I don't recall the actual numbers, but it was shockingly low how much other channels of communication, you know, body language, visual, um, facial expression. And when you get down to just the written word, it's something like 10% of meaning is actually trans, uh, transmitted. I don't know if it's that low. Do you, do you know off the top of your head? I love the idea of I don't know of, what the percent of, of including a video recording. That's great. Yeah, I mean I, I have I have an example. I mean I'm right now having a misunderstanding with I just had to fire somebody. Um, and we had a misunderstanding, but we did it all over email and it was terrible. Had we had a video conversation with each other, the conversation I'm sure would have been I didn't even take my own advice, you know, because it's it's hard to have those conversations, you know, it's way easier to fire somebody over email than it is over video. So, uh, you know, that's that's really a note for people is that you know the video is more engaging and you know it's more confronting and that is why we should use it. Exactly. And and that's the whole reason you chose not to. You couldn't stand totally. the, the empathy connection of the person um, who you were so disappointed that you had to discharge. Well, let's look at the other end of that. How do you hire people when you might never meet them in real life? How do you assess them? How do you how do you do remote hiring? 
Well, it's funny. I, I kind of use the same, same techniques for that. I My first step in all the candidates that I do for myself personally, but also for the Happy Melly team is I have them send a three minute video that they make of themselves answering a couple of easy questions that I have. And the goal for that is to see first, what is, what do they, how comfortable are they with technology? Can they record a video and upload it and send it to me from, you know, they can upload it to YouTube or send me the file. I, I want a Google drive. I want to see how they do it. Um, and that tells me a lot. And then what also tells me a lot is how they appear on screen. So what is their work environment like? Do they have a quiet environment? Are their kids screaming or, you know, what you, you can get a lot from just seeing somebody and uh, and how they work in just the first three to five minutes. So that's where I start. And then I use various mediums to talk to people. So I'll use texting to see like how good are they with instant messaging? And I use like Slack or email to just see, you know, what's their response time? Are they familiar with the tools? And then when I'm ready, I set up a meeting and I set it up using my time zone, not theirs, because I want to see, are they time zone savvy? Like, can they translate the meeting into, you know, and I don't send them the meeting request. I say, put it in your own calendar. And I want to see, like, do they know how to speak in different time zones? Are they aware of that? So there's all these little easy things without having somebody to go through too many hoops or too big of a jump. There's all these small things that I use to assess how comfortable they are with online work. And it works pretty well. So to our savvy listeners that are looking to work with Lisset, you now know some of the key ways to get through uh, the <laughs> recruitment <true>. process. <laughs> totally true. And it's not that hard. None of these things are that hard. But it, I mean, it is really important because I've gone on interviews with people, you know, and they're sitting in their grandmother's kitchen with a tank top and there's kids screaming everywhere. And like, this is how this is what they used for their video interview to me. Now, not saying that maybe they're perfectly comfortable in their grandmother's kitchen with kids running around and screaming. Um, maybe that's perfectly fine for them. But in terms of like a remote environment and working on a team, it's just it wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, for uh, at the time. So it's, uh, it's amazing how much you can get from just turning the video on. And a lot of people don't like it. But I'm like, you know, if you work in a co-located office, you have to show up every day for work and you have to get dressed professionally and go into the office. Turning on the video is equivalent to that, in my opinion. Yeah. One of the, so I want to move forward, like more patterns for success. You've talked about good technology, good tools, working agreements. Uh, a couple of things that I want to touch on. Meeting facilitation. Oh, yeah. Totally on my list. Water cooler moments, uh, team building and bonding. I know you've been teaching workshops and a lot of this. So a few more minutes of things that you've uncovered that really make a difference. Virtual meeting is very different than face-to-face meeting. So what are some things you do in terms of facilitation? So I like to start with an icebreaker question. Uh, So that's a quick a very, it's a quick question. So, and if you're doing a team building meeting, then I would choose something that's longer. Uh, but for just a normal meeting, I choose a quick question, like take a picture of your shoes of what you're wearing right now and let people know, or take a picture of what's outside and what are you looking at in your backyard at the moment? Or um, it could be, what's the story of your name or what's your favorite food? Um, and the point of that is not just to be silly and have fun, but the point is to get everybody speaking before the meeting starts, because science shows that if you've spoken once, then you're more likely to speak up again. So it's a little trick. And at the same time, you're team building because when you know the story of somebody's name and their favorite food and where they like to go on vacation, they start to become more of a well-rounded person. So in terms of facilitation, that's one of my favorites to start with. I love that. How do you replace the serendipity of both showing up at the water cooler or the coffee machine at the same time and the casual, hey, what are you working on today? So for that, I think you have to get a little more sophisticated than just video conferencing tools because uh, you're never going to accidentally bump into somebody online in general. One way of doing that, if you only have video conferencing tools, one way to do that is to have a policy where people show up uh, five, 10 minutes before the meeting starts. That's just for like those that want to say hi, check in with other people, see how the weekend was. So you can sort of build it into your meeting time. 
that way. So you get casual conversation and the meeting can start on time. Whoever wants to join for the casual can join and then the rest of the people join for the meeting. You can, of course, do it after the meeting, but that generally doesn't happen so often because everybody's pretty much done after a meeting. But the next level of that is the use of virtual offices. And uh, that is a surprisingly powerful tool. And I'm always shocked at how popular it isn't. So uh, there's, a, there's a number of virtual offices. There's Sococo, there's Walkabout Office, uh, Bizner, I think it's called Puka Team or Pucka Team. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So there's a number of them. I know there's a market for it, but I'm always surprised by how few teams use it. And what these virtual offices are, basically an office that you go to online. So you, you know, you, it's either an app or in the browser. You show up, you see a floor plan of a virtual office, you see avatars of your fellow colleagues, and you can just essentially double click on their office if you want to go to their office and talk to them. And you can usually only see and hear the people that are in the same office with you, but you can see where everybody else is on the virtual floor plan. And what that is awesome for is... One, you don't have to schedule meetings with each other. You can like knock on somebody's virtual door if you just want to stop by for a quick question. And the other thing is just that visual being able to see everybody adds a team building aspect that can't be replicated that I know of in any other way except virtual reality. But that gets a little too far out for most teams. But a virtual office, super easy to use, uh, not that expensive and shockingly powerful. If you have a team that's working generally in the same time uh, time zones or, because, or you know, that's overlap. when you're actually working together or some overlap. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll, I'll include notes uh, in our show notes, links to those tools. I, I'm wondering why. So you said they, you're not seeing as widespread adoption. What, what do you think the barrier is right now? Any I think ideas? it's because, um, yeah. I've, oh, for sure. I've been thinking about it a lot because I run a virtual co-working group where I am often the only person in the virtual co-working space. Well, Pilar and I are both there very often. Hi, Pilar. Um, and other people trickle in here and there. But yeah. Hi, Pilar. Love Pilar. She does virtualnotdistant.com. So shameless plug. Yeah. And uh, uh, but but very few people use it. And I think it's because it's very difficult to grok unless you've seen it. So you can conceptualize it. I just described it and people are like, oh, that's interesting. But until you actually see it and you experience it, you don't actually understand how powerful it really is. I think that's the problem. Yeah. When you talk to the various companies, I imagine they're different sizes. Did anybody talk about a growth limit for a remote team? Does it break down at a certain size, just become unworkable? I haven't experienced a team that says that it's unworkable. I mean, global corporations, like take Ericsson, for example. I mean, they've existed forever and they've worked globally forever. And even though you've got patches of co-location all over the place, you still have tons of remote connections that need to be made. So they're experiencing, I mean, that they're experiencing exactly the same thing. I yeah, I haven't seen the limit. I, I can't say for sure. I mean, I'm. it's clearly it gets harder as you scale because, but it gets harder as you scale any company. I mean, how do you keep hundreds or thousands of people aligned around the company mission and the company goal? You've got so many moving parts and so many departments. I think virtual or co-located, it's a challenge regardless. You have the same fundamental problems. How do you align? How do you keep the vision? Yeah. So maybe, right. maybe it doesn't matter, remote or distributed. I mean, there are things that you need to do remotely if you scale. Like, for instance, um, if you start to get global on a remote team, you really need to bring in some HR specialists that can handle the hiring and the paperwork and the tax laws and the, you know, all the logistics. Like, you you don't you can't rely on team members themselves to take care of all of that stuff. You definitely at a certain level, and I think. When I interviewed Bree Reynolds from Flex Jobs, I think she said it was above 25 people. I think it was her. It was either that or, or the Greenback Expat Tax Services uh, folks. But they said at 25 was about the time that you needed to start thinking about HR specialists. It started getting a little more complicated. Yeah. All right. So these are all the patterns for success, anti-patterns. If you had one, two, or three things to say, whatever you do, don't do X, what might they be? What are the gotchas? 
Oh, man. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Whatever you do, don't. Oh, here's one. Whatever you do, don't let things fester. Mm. And on remote teams, that's a great one to try and solve because little things can build up over time. And little things include, like, for example, I worked with a woman once who used email like an instant message program. So you just get a, you know, a barrage of emails one after another with various thoughts. But it was just, you know, she she should have been using an instant message program. No big deal. I can delete all the emails. But over time, it becomes annoying and I stop wanting to communicate with her. And that is death on a remote team. So when that happens, there needs to be some sort of a forum or some sort of way of expressing tiny annoyances that are maybe, I mean, you know, they're so small, you don't want to bring them up in the moment because it's so small, you don't even want to make an issue out of it, except that over time, those things totally build up and then people blow in the weirdest of ways. So yeah, I would say if, yeah, if if there's anything uh, you shouldn't do is don't, uh, don't keep things bottled up find ways of releasing those small niggles, I think they call them. It could be part of the team agreement, right? You work that in, how, yeah. how you process. Uh, and, and as we say, don't die the death of a thousand cuts. Right. And that is really hard on a team because there's some people that feel comfortable expressing themselves and some people who really don't. And most people don't. I mean, it's hard to give feedback to somebody, especially when it's of the negative form. It could be even that you have to give feedback to a manager or, um, you know, somebody who controls your paycheck or, you know, it, it's a, uh, it can be, it can be scary. In real life or in virtual teams, it's the same. Uh, <laughs> exactly. A lot of it does translate over. A lot of it translates over. It's just with virtual teams, it's critical. It, it is critical, but it's probably easier to pretend you're ignoring it. Right. So if you're in the same room and you're upset, somebody might see your expression change or your body language change and they might get a hint. Virtually, it totally. would just be silence. And, and then you it's got to be, oh, did, did she get my 27 emails today? Or maybe she's on vacation or maybe she's pissed off at me. And, and when you're on pissed off, you're just right. like, yeah, I'm going to let it go. Let it go. I'll try to. But it does fester. Interesting. It totally festers. Yeah, I see it all the time. I mean, on the Happy Melly team, we have, you know, it's, it's, it says Happy Melly, it says happy in the name, but we have a lot of issues that we have to go through, a lot of issues. And it's because, you know, there's personality differences and culture differences. One person's really blunt and the other person's really passive. And yeah, I mean, same, same as any team. Right. Don't let it fester. Whatever you do, don't let it fester. Well, we're coming up on time. And... I want to give you a chance to tell us a little bit more about the book, how we get it. I'll make sure the URLs end up in the speaker notes and any workshops you've got coming up and what else, how people can get in touch with you. So start with the book. Where can we get it? Okay. Uh, you can get the book right now. If you go to collaboration, superpowers.com slash book, you'll find a link where uh, you can order the book. And, uh, and it's this book in particular is made for those who are very wary about remote work. You're not sure, you're skeptical, you don't think you can work, you can do it. It's, it's made for the Patrick Lencioni's of the world <clears throat> who think that co-located teams will always be better than virtual teams. And so this book is going to take you through the journey of you know, addressing all the fears, addressing all the myths, and then giving you the solutions for how to do that. And I specifically made it for individuals, teams, and managers, because most books out there are just for the managers. But I wanted to make it for, hey, if you're on a team, what do you do? Or what if you're a solopreneur or a freelancer? What are the things do you have to be thinking about? So yeah, it's a it's a big, long journey, the, <laughs> the book. It really is the handbook for how to work remotely all in one place. Uh, so that's the book. You do some workshops. Tell us about your workshop. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The workshops. Yeah. The Work Together Anywhere workshop. So the point of the workshop is when you take it, you come out with a roadmap for how you want your team to work remotely. And what I mean by roadmap is there. <clears throat> the thing that I found with the interviews is there is no one right way to work remotely. 
every team has a different situation. It has a different configuration, different personalities, and you're going to have to find what works best for your team. So the workshop, what it does is it exposes you to a whole bunch of different tools, of course, and techniques. You get to experience what a virtual office is like. You get to teleport to another country. Um, and in the end, you basically come out with a super action plan of ideas that you can take back to your team and try. And the, the good news is, is none of it is rocket science and none of it's hard. The bad news is you have to do it. <laughs> so there's two aspects of it. One is, you know, you have to learn what all the different techniques are. And then the next is you have to do it. Yeah. What are the best ways for our listeners to get in touch with you? Oh man, collaborationsuperpowers.com. All the information is there. All the podcast interviews are there. The resources, I have a great resources page if people want to check out the tools and some of the more popular um, pages I have for tips. Like if you're looking for a remote job or if you're trying to hire remote candidates, you know, that kind of working in time zone is on there. So lots of great tips there. Well, thank you, Lisette. And thank you, our listening audience. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a review or a rating on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast platform you use. It really helps others find us out. And if this is your first time tuning in, please subscribe. Catch our next episode. If you'd like to join our discussion and share the stories about how you're experimenting with remote teams and uh, maybe share a good gin and tonic virtually, come over to coalition.agileuprising.com. And finally support from listeners just like you help us cover our hosting and production costs see the show notes for details on how you can become a patron of the agile uprising podcast till next time this is andy Cleff signing out <laughs>